So thank you for your practice, for the stillness that's developing and that sense of just being here, just arriving in the moment, waiting in the moment. It struck me just now that it's quite a subversive act. It goes against the ways of the world, the streams of craving and desire. We simply learn to stay where we are and to welcome and open to it. So today I wanted to give a little bit of guidance to introduce a, a concept that I found really helpful that my teacher Ajahn Brown shared and this is called the two types of waiting. So there's waiting in the future or there's waiting in the moment. Do you recognize these two types of waiting in your life? Waiting in the future. How much of our lives do we spend doing this? Apparently I heard a, a, a little talk somewhere that mentioned that we spend six months of our lives in queues, <laughs> just lining up. And if we live in countries like Asia, especially India, at least in the times that I was there, you could spend six hours a day on a bad day waiting to get to the front of that queue. <laughs> but there are so many other in-between moments in our lives when we're waiting to get somewhere else. We're walking from the Dhamma Hall, sitting meditation, to the walking meditation room. And what about that gap in between? What's happening there? Are you still waiting in the moment? Are you waiting for the next activity, the next event? So, so much of our lives we wait in the future for something to change, for something to happen, to get on to the next thing, something better, something that the Buddha's teaching promises, right? We bring this attitude to our meditation too, waiting for the practice to develop, waiting for the stillness to deepen. And this is natural, you know, maybe this is partly a wholesome and wise intention, but we just shift that little bit into the future and out of the moment where that possibility for deepening is made, is real. So waiting in the moment is something much softer and it's learning to really stay unconditionally with what's right here. I like this idea of mindfulness as unconditional awareness. We're aware of whatever's arising, we're aware no matter what, and we learn to soften that awareness through using skillful perceptions. So we wait in the moment, not to get onto the next thing, but just to be right here as a loving companion to whatever is right in front of us at this time. The Buddha said that the cause of suffering is in essence desire or wanting. But another um, definition he used, which comes within that, is this idea of being associated with the disliked and separated from the liked. And isn't this just what waiting in the future is about? We're separated from this moment. And in that sense, you could say that suffering is the gap between where we are now and where we want to be. So by waiting in the moment, we start to close that gap. We bring our happiness you know, not from the world of fantasies, right? We bring this idea of happiness in the future into this present moment by becoming a loving companion to the moment. And this changes the quality of the moment itself. So I have an example of these two types of waiting from a train journey that I took many, many years ago in India, which is where I started my spiritual path. And this train journey lasted for not three hours, not 30 hours, <laughs> but almost three days. And at first I approached it as something to get through, you know, something to bear. Like, it's going to be a long time, I'd better just knuckle down and kind of bide my time somehow. And I noticed I was looking at the clock a little bit. But the interesting thing was that uh, when I realised this, I changed my attitude. I started to relax and settle in to the ride. Just settle in and start to open my eyes to what was around. And over time, you know, the days and nights seemed to blur. You just would sleep whenever you could, wake up whenever, you know, most of the time. I must admit, I don't sleep well on trains. But this concept of time, this burden of time started to disappear. 
And not only that, I started to engage with the other passengers. And many of them were like Indian families and they would open up these chapatis and Indian curry and share it around. And there was so much laughter and lightness and joy when I started to creatively engage. And of course, you can imagine that the train journey went very, very quickly then. And by the time we arrived, it was almost too soon, you know, because I'd really settled in. And in a sense, this is what our practice lives are like. They're not the quick tube stop from A to B. They're like that very long train journey. We don't know when we're going to arrive. And if we can learn to enjoy the process, enjoy the journey, then it's as though it doesn't even matter anymore. You know, that creativity, that love, that kindness is what nourishes the heart and allows the practice to develop on its own. So it's about putting these causes in place. And of course, the first step in that is often just relaxing the body and mind. As Yael was saying this morning, this sense of releasing the tensions or at least inviting the tension to release. We can't make ourselves relax. That's another kind of trying, but we can give ourselves that invitation. And in order to help us relax, we need to feel safe. So one of the very skillful perceptions and attitudes that I wanted to bring up now is this beautiful practice of loving kindness, one of the most powerful practices and one of my favorite practices in the Buddha's teachings something that is a very deep virtue and gives rise to the other virtues. If we have a mind of loving kindness, we become harmless towards ourselves and towards others. Even animals respond. You know, so it is something real. It starts with a perception, a disposition to life. But it, be, it has tangible effects in the world. We become one who is harmless, one who others feel safe around. And sometimes we are the person that we need to develop loving kindness towards, to feel safe with ourselves, safe with our minds. So we choose the lens of loving kindness. And in the suttas, there's a very beautiful passage that talks about loving kindness in practice. Um, the relationship between three wise monks who later went on to become fully enlightened. And it says that they were blending like milk and water, and regarding one another with kindly eyes. In a sense, this is how it became on that train ride. We started to relax around each other, feel safe, regard each other with kindly eyes, like a family for those three days, you know, sharing food, sharing stories. And this is what we can learn to do in our lives, towards our minds. We can learn to choose the lens of loving kindness, to regard ourselves, to regard the world, and it's an antidote to this fault-finding mind. How many of us have a very strong inner critic or inner tyrant that we feel is somehow real and solid? Like everything else, it's been conditioned. It's the voice of others quite often, people who have said things to us or you know, things that have really jarred and have got stuck in our perception and we've attributed them to who we think we are. You know, we've taken them up, we've taken up this burden and cultivated or consolidated a sense of self out of that. So it's a very beautiful antidote to this fault-finding mind. And fault-finding goes into our meditation practice too. It's ironic that in some ways, the longer we practice, the more important patience becomes. You know, many people, or at least many monastics, and probably lay folks too, who've been practicing a long time, start to get more impatient and more eager for the results. You know, recently, there's been a few people in our wider community who've disrobed, and many of them have been in robes for 20 odd years. And my sense, in a couple of those cases is that it was just taking too long. It was just taking too long. They didn't have the, uh, the loving kindness, the forgiveness, the patience with the process that such a long journey involves. And also this sense of enjoyment. And loving kindness is something that can bring a lot of joy to practice. It's what the Buddha called a wholesome happiness. There are different kinds of happiness on this path. 
Obviously, there's a happiness of sensuality, the happiness of pleasant sounds, sights, smells, tastes, and touches. But they're so transitory, they're so elusive, and a lot of the time completely out of our control. You know, today you wanted to do some walking meditation, and I think the plan was to do it outdoors, but hey, it rained just at that time. It's completely out of control. So the pleasures of the senses are not to be relied upon. It's not that there's no gratification there, but the pleasures of the mind that come from a virtue, come from a life well lived, come from a mind of loving kindness, are much more wholesome, much more nourishing, and give the mind that lightness, that buoyancy, that expansive, soft, embracing quality that gives us resilience to life. Another really important thing, powerful aspect of loving-kindness is the skillful use of thought. And so far in this retreat we've been using a lot of perceptions and feelings and attitudes, but sometimes thought is very important, very skillful too. And thoughts of loving-kindness directly um, displace any possible thoughts of ill will or cruelty. It's simply impossible to have a thought of loving-kindness along with a thought of ill-will at the same time. So to this extent, we're purifying our mind, we're cultivating wholesome states. And this is just another tool we can use to really build up the happiness inside. Thoughts also have a very significant uh, role in building delusion or disentangling it. The Buddha talks about something called the vipalasas, which mean the distortions of thought, perception, and view. And these three revolve around each other. Often it's view, perception, and thought. But if you think about this, we often have a fixed view of life, of ourselves, of another. And because of that, we tend to perceive them a certain way. You know, It's like if you've always been thinking that you're bad at something. Whenever you make that mistake, there, there I go, that just proves it. That's what you see. You're blind to the times you got it right. Delusion is something that blinds us. We simply don't see our success because we're looking out for the failure again and again and again. And because of that, we start to think, I'm the one who always, whatever it is, <laughs> whatever is your favorite self-view. <laughs> and again, this informs our view. You know, it's the same thing with um, people that we love. If we have a view of them as a very uh, kind and caring person, then we tend to perceive them that way. And it actually influences the way they show up. If we're looking for their beauty, for their virtue, they tend to show it to us. And then we think about them in a wonderful way and we develop more loving kindness. This is ideal, right? So thoughts of loving kindness are to be developed in public and in private. It's a way that we can use our minds. Even when we're not feeling very loving, we can still invite those thoughts. And gradually the mind will incline to the feeling, to the perception of loving kindness until it becomes our character, it becomes our default state. And it is a much more comfortable um, and easeful and in a sense, profound state of mind than the fault-finding mind. Although, like Yehel was saying, sometimes our default is to find fault, to be negative, to be angry or impatient. You know, we're so used to it, it's just a habit, that's all. It's not who we are, it's just a habit we've acquired throughout this life, maybe over many lives, if you go that far back, if you believe in such things. But sometimes these habits can seem intractable. But with loving kindness, we gradually change the way our minds think. And many a time I've been practicing loving kindness using a little bit of thought and uh, feeling that nothing much is happening. But then later on, I'll make some kind of mistake or, you know, do something that I usually have a bit of irritability about. And I find myself just thinking, oh, it's okay. You know, never mind. Oh, sweetie, not that again, you know. The tone of the voice changes, the kind of response changes, because we've been inclining our minds that way. So it is a perception, it is a lens, but as Yael was saying earlier, and I completely agree, mindfulness is never neutral. 
Mindfulness always carries some kind of attitude or perception along with it. You know, there's one time I was meditating in Perth, and it's happened many times, but this is a more recent example. And I thought I was being welcoming. I thought I was being aware. I was doing all the right things, you know, sitting with a lot of grief, actually, a lot of grief and a, a sort of heavy feeling of sadness in my stomach, and it seemed to pervade most of my body. So I widened my awareness, you know, I sort of gave it space, um, tried to be with it. But what I didn't realize is that I was doing that so that it would dissolve. It was very, very subtle, but when I realized this, I realized that the mindfulness wasn't neutral. It was actually somehow brittle. There was a, a kind of, I don't know if you can kind of sense that. It's like there's a certain slight resistance that just keeps you away from that emotion and keeps you away from finding a skillful relationship with it. And as soon as I saw it, I remembered compassion. And just the very thought of compassion, which has been a practice of mine, suffused the awareness with that emotion. And almost in an instant, it transformed into bliss. It transformed into something so light and pleasant and actually blissful without any kind of demand. Right? So when we practice loving kindness or when we uh, employ any skillful perception, try to do it unconditionally, with unconditional awareness. We're, we're loving just to be loving, just for the sake of loving. We're giving our mind, our body, our whole life to the practice just for the sake of giving, without expecting anything in return. This is a very beautiful word with unconditional without expecting anything in return, or no matter what, no matter what. So I'd like to introduce this practice a little bit, if you wish to follow, and uh, just see if we can bring that bit more softness, that bit more kindliness to the way that we're aware. So... Taking all the time that you need. By checking in with your body, how your body would like to be positioned right now. Letting your body take the lead. minutes so please just check whether you're still comfortable on the floor or whether you'd like to move to a chair. I know many many meditators who get very deep meditation on chairs and there's actually a beautiful stone carving of the future Buddha Maitreya, Maitreya which means metta, loving kindness, sitting on a chair. I think it's in the Allura or Ajanta Caves in India. So if you're sitting in a chair, you could be the future Buddha. slight adjustments to your posture is already an expression of kindness and care. You're tending to your body, you're waiting on your body. In a kind, loving, respectful way. So just checking if your ankles are comfortable on the cushion. Nothing's pressing too hard. Or if you're on a chair that there's no undue strain on your ankles or knees. And 
Noticing your knees, whether they're bent loosely or tightly, and making any adjustments with care. Noticing your buttocks, perhaps any pressure or anything trapped under the buttocks and just releasing, relaxing them so your weight is evenly distributed as far as you can. Allowing the thigh muscles to expand and relax. If you're seated on a chair, just check whether you're holding your thighs together. See if they might be more at ease. You gently loosen them that little bit. Noticing your hips. The whole base of the trunk. sense of groundedness. Stillness. It brings you into this moment. Checking the position of your spine, your back. Sometimes you might find it naturally straightens up. Other times it's comfortable to lean against the back of a chair. Just notice what your spine, your back, wants to do right now. Coming to your shoulders, often an area where we hold a lot of tension. Sometimes I like to gently roll my shoulders back. And then allow them to settle naturally, perhaps adjusting the position of your hands, your arms. And sensing down through your arms, your elbows, your hands, relaxing the fingertips. Noticing your belly, allowing your belly just to be soft. Checking that your clothing is not too tight around your belly. Adjusting it if so. Feeling that expansion in the belly and the chest. As the breath comes in, a sense of relaxation when the breath leaves the body. And just feeling into your neck. 
finding the most comfortable position for your neck so that it can carry the weight of your head. Allowing the jaw cheeks, the eyes, the brow to relax. Allowing the brain to relax as you enter the feeling part of the mind. Just becoming aware, allowing your awareness to expand to include the whole body. Suffusing your body with the light of mindfulness and the warmth of kindness like the light and the warmth of the sun. If it helps, you could imagine that you're in a very beautiful, quiet, safe place. Perhaps a real place that's special to you. you feel safe, you feel at ease, or maybe an imaginary place, maybe by the sea or in a jungle or forest. And you're just receiving, basking in the light and the warmth of the sun. Allowing it to pervade your body. The light of the sun is like mindfulness, illuminating whatever it shines upon. And along with that light is the warmth. the kindness, that allows your whole body to be at ease. Imagine just soaking up those golden rays of sunshine through every pore of your skin, into every cell of your body.
And if you wish to start developing loving kindness, imagine that in this beautiful place where the sun is shining down onto you, you're sitting with a very dear person, maybe a friend or perhaps a teacher. Maybe a child, someone who brings a sense of warmth to your heart. An inner smile. Someone who you care deeply about or who cares deeply for you. And imagine you're regarding one another with kindly eyes, eyes of well-wishing. And notice how this feels in your body, perhaps around the area of your chest, if that's comfortable for you. Bringing this person's presence to mind, as though they were right there with you. naturally for you, offering them some words of loving kindness, simple, genuine wishes for their well-being, without expecting anything in return, just offering these gifts, these phrases as gifts, from your heart to theirs. Phrases such as, may you be happy. May you be free. May you be healed. May you be at peace, just sensing in to whatever resonates for you in relation to this special person in your life. Staying connected to the sense of their presence, to your own body, and to the meaning of each phrase. And pausing in the space between each phrase to allow the mind to incline towards the meaning of loving kindness, the felt experience that's growing within. It's as though each phrase is like a seed that you plant in very fertile soil. A 
and the silence between each phrase is suffused by your mindfulness and kindness. Just planting seeds and allowing the flower of metta to bloom in its own time. Just finding that balance between cultivation and relaxation. Perhaps <coughs> continuing to offer these phrases, these gifts, blessings of love and kindness. Perhaps widening the gap between each phrase or dropping down to a single word. Just to keep the mind inclined to the perception, the feeling of loving kindness.
I'd like to invite you to gently allow the perception of this very dear person to fade. Perhaps once again just smiling inwardly toward them with a sense of gratitude. Let's see how it would feel to bring your own body, your own breath, into your mind as a friend. Regarding your own body and breath, including your entire emotional world with kindly eyes, with a soft gaze of loving kindness. See if your mind inclines towards the feelings in the body or perhaps towards the breath, a very simple, beautiful perception. A very loyal friend. Give all your care, all your love to this single breath. Perhaps noticing how your body, your breath, responds.
and just noticing if you welcome and allow not only the difficult feelings of perhaps aches or tension in the body or mind, but also the pleasant feelings. Can you invite them in too with kindly eyes, allowing yourself to receive any joy any peace, however subtle it may be, with a sense of gratitude and respect. And to end this meditation, just gently wishing yourself well. Whatever way feels resonant for you. Once again, allowing this loving awareness to spread through your body. Noticing how your body feels now. How your breath feels. Has the perception of loving kindness changed the way you experience the body, the feelings in the body and the breath?
If so, how? <laughs> well, I have to admit that I lost track of time. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, we'll just shift the next walking meditation, I guess. And have the next walking from now, which is 4.15, until about uh, quarter to five. And then the last sitting meditation will be in here at, uh, what would that be, quarter to five. Time has no meaning now. <laughs> <laughs> These little things with red symbols and <laughs> beeping sounds. Okay, so see if you can continue to keep your mind soft and light and kind so that whatever arises it arises in a spacious mind <laughs> 